testing. Check, check. Okay. Hello and welcome to Turf Conversion, a starter guide for planning and decision making. My name is Nick Voss, Education and Outreach Coordinator at VLAMO, the Badness Lake Area Water Management Organization. This talk is recorded in May of 2022 and it serves as a support brainstorming planning tool for cost share applicants, um, anyone in our watershed who's curious about different ways to mix up your yard routine and uh, also why, why bother mixing up your yard routine. I will cover connecting the dots from turf to the watershed or from the yard to the watershed, options for what to switch to and what to consider in that process, steps and resources as you go through a conversion process and sod and despoil and excuse me sod and soil disposal options as i mentioned this is a great segue into the landscape cost share grant program uh, lamo has different levels of funding that allow for different types of projects that can be simple or complex depending on uh, business or property owner uh, interest. So the first reason of why bother, why try to mix up our landscape and uh, switch from turf to something else. Uh, well, turf is pretty practical in a way that it's, it's designed to shed water away in many cases. It's um, graded in a way to take water off the landscape and it allows for recreation and play and that's a great thing uh, turf in itself isn't inherently bad but uh, we just have a lot of it and uh, it does impact the water cycle it changes the cycle from a watershed to what you might call a pipe shed uh, so this picture that has lots of runoff draining right off the grass goes into the storm drain storm drain goes directly unfiltered into the nearest lake, stream, uh, sometimes a wetland. Um, so it's green, but it's sometimes called green concrete because once turf is saturated, it's a dense mat, it doesn't have deep roots, and it can shed water right off the surface. With that comes sediment and nutrients. And here's our watershed. We're about 24 square miles. In the northeast metro that pink outline area are the major wetlands that we have so in addition to our lakes we have over 500 wetlands in this area and those are all uh, just as important as the lakes uh, in terms of the water cycle um, as i mentioned uh, we have a lot of grass we also have a lot of pavement and uh, Pavement generates runoff. Uh, with that comes anything that's on the pavement. So this picture is a look at a storm outfall in Wiper Township, just south of Highway 96. Uh, all that sediment is coming from the surface and attached to it are nutrients like phosphorus, other gunk items like oil or antifreeze, um, salt. Um, and what we do with uh, most of our developed landscape is we speed up the rate at which sediment and nutrients are moving off the surface. Um, so all that has an impact downstream. And here's a picture of Kentucky bluegrass compared to a variety of prairie species. Um, Prairie forbs and grasses are deep rooted. They have a lot more layers to hold soil and kind of create a factory in the soil. Um, all these layers and, and that plant mass going as far as six to 10 or more down, 10 feet or more down, um, allows for bacteria, fungi, all the soil organisms to do their work. So that actually helps funnel uh, water and air into the soil and it uh, it keeps things being processed um, nutrients and and water is uptaken by the roots and um, it opens up pores and maintains those pores in the soil 
well that's the map again and this is what the landscape uh, pre-European settlement really looked like we had a lot of wet prairie what you would call mazic areas uh, wet meadow and uh, that's a lovely cross stitch, cross stitch picture that a volunteer sent to us uh, comparing Kentucky bluegrass to um, native prairie species so the landscaping uh, has a spectrum uh, this image of inside the house uh, is a great metaphor for what's outside in the watershed um, inside we have a variety of uses you need some storage you need some decoration you got some pillows you got a practical use for uh, umbrellas and maybe some towels books things like that you know it's got to be livable space and when you think about this like a watershed uh, it's the same concept you wouldn't really want a watershed full of pillows or full of storage or full of books um, the the mixture of some variety some uh, practicality for uses a little bit of flair and most of all storage space is really a reflection of a healthy watershed um, storing water of diverse plant species um, and, and a whole a whole bunch of different adaptations that you could have because you've got the space and you've got the flexibility uh, to to let plants do what they do um, so starting at the bottom of the spectrum you have the conventional turf you have uh, low vegetative cover and low complexity um, it's a carpet it's green it's predictable some areas you want to have that uh, and it helps other things in life keep moving that's great um, but then you move a little forward uh, move up the spectrum and you start to increase the diversity you increase complexity while still having a, a short vegetative cover so that's where bee lawns come into play uh, plants like red and white clover creeping thyme not to be confused with creeping charlie self heal and ground plum and after after that further in the spectrum you start to get high standing vegetation in predictable areas so in this picture you know, most of that turf is a yard that's just conventional very predictable but it's kind of the gardener focus okay this area is going to be sectioned off for higher plants more complexity but there's much more you could do uh, to play with the spectrum there's sections that you could have higher standing vegetation and very low complexity very predictable uh, ground cover sedges um, could follow a, a house or a a planting bed uh, something that you don't want to mow around you just want to reduce the amount of turf uh, this kind of cover is a great strategy for that and then you start getting into even higher standing vegetation that is still uniform and pretty low in complexity uh, this picture on the right is an example in the watershed that reduce the turf to almost half where the yard is not just the default but it becomes a path or it becomes a curvature feature of the yard and uh, just as much a feature are the plants that surround it uh, so that's a way to create balance and kind of uh, shift the thinking about how much yard space you need uh, depending on what you are actually using Now, further into the spectrum, uh, when you think about the yard, the the flat space that you're using, uh, the, there's the ability to turn that into higher standing vegetation. This is a different type of turf altogether. You get into the no mow and low mow varieties, mostly tall and fine fescues. Uh, this is where uh, you can convert this over and still get that lawn benefit, but you're you're just creating simplicity and you're getting higher standing vegetation which in turn is deeper roots and that helps that soil um, and all of those uh, watershed storage uh, features little higher into the vegetative cover uh, a little more complexity 
And then you start to get into designated areas, into a shoreline or a buffer between a wetland or a ditch. Um, high standing vegetation serving as a buffer is a great way to uh, support the water. It filters runoff nutrients, it creates more of a space for the water table to uh, do what it does and um, have space to uh, work and absorb into the soil. Um, and, and that's a great thing. After that, you have the full prairie that could be the whole yard. So that's high standing vegetation, more complexity. Uh, this kind of yard care routine is much more of a conventional, or it's not a conventional yard care routine, obviously. Um, this is going to require periodic burns to maintain a prairie without uh, getting woody species to encroach into it. Um, but for some folks, that's uh, an attractive thing to do. Uh, if you're not using it for play, uh, you get a lot of scenic value and a whole lot of soil benefits um, to the greater watershed with that strategy. And then there's the spectrum of water, of how wet things are. So in addition to what kind of standing vegetation or complexity you want, um, there's a lot of different options for uh, upland to emergent plant choices. A lot of times we treat our yards as if they always have to perform like an upland landscape. Uh, when in reality, that there's a whole spectrum that's uh, that's out there. The transition zone is uh, an important space, uh, like I mentioned with those buffers, uh, between the w standing water and upland. Um, there's plants that will specialize in that transition zone. And then there's the emergent zone, where things can be flooded for a week or more, and you know it might even be a floodplain. Um, these are areas that uh, don't want to be turf, and uh, it can be a lot harder if you try to force them to be a, a lawn. So getting into the examples of how to uh, approach the steps and uh, what kind of uh, things to think about as you're planning. The sod kicker is probably the most popular way to take a Kentucky bluegrass turf and strip it, roll it, and start fresh for something new. The gas powered is a fair amount of work and the sod kicker is uh, where you can expect to get a full workout. Um, one of the old school sod kickers are something you would have to rent at a uh, tool rental location and um, take an afternoon, wet the soil before you start kicking away but um, it's doable and, and very effective. If you're not wanting to do the physical removal, there is the smother technique. So this means you'll have a lot of time on your hands. Uh, this one you'll want to mow as short as possible. Water thoroughly right away. Place newspaper or cardboard over the area. Uh, that's a lot of newspaper, up to 20 layers. None of those glossy inserts or cardboard, remove all the tape and staples. Water again to get that material soggy and add four to six inches of soil or compost on top of it. Give that up to eight weeks to kill off the turf and you'll be able to uh, seed plant right over the top of that. But the longer the better uh, to really get your consistency. Herbicide is another option, so it's uh, a little less uh, physical work and it's faster than the smothering technique. Um, what you're trying to do here is kill off the crown. The crown is this area of the uh, turf plant. You don't want it to be white. Uh, it'll end up being this uh, dead uh, light brown color. Um, if it's yellow, it's also um, it might still be alive, but uh, it'll feel dry and it gets crusty. Um, I should add, with the herbicide, um, these are uh, areas that it's very important to 
apply it according to the directions. Um, herbicide isn't isn't uh, illegal or it's not, it's not banned in any way, um, but uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, advocates to use it well um, so that so that it remains that way. Um, if it's misused, it is an issue. Um, you have to apply on days where it's not windy. Uh, it'll have adequate time to break down and finish its job. Um, the best time to do this is actually in the late summer, early fall. That's when plants are are um, prepping for winter and will readily take up uh, more of the herbicide and effectively be killed off. Um, a lot of times if folks use herbicide in the spring or summer, um, it might give plants to uh, a time to recover and then you'd just be doing it over again. So once your turf is done, or if it's dead, if you haven't physically moved it, you want to mow it as low as possible. You're trying to make space for new things to come and grow through it. So you mow it low and break up that mat of dense roots that are just shallow but, but dense on the top. Uh, Dethatcher is a great way to do that. Uh, make space for new seeds to come in. Um, that picture of a dethatcher in the background of this photo is, is a uh, example from a resident in the watershed who started from scratch and dethatching is also used as a light tilling. Um, it's light enough so that it doesn't stir up as many seeds in the seed bank, which you don't want to do in this case. Um, you have a lot of hard work ahead of you, but uh, it gives a little texture for the seeds to sit. Uh, another way to do that is aeration, depending on the needs of your soil. Uh, aeration can be a good way to prep. And then, depending on the grading and how uneven it might be, you might need a flattener or a roller to prep the, the new turf space. And then finally, after all that prep, depending on what approach you take, you get to the seeding. So you seed according to the dispersal rate that, that uh, is your type of seed that you're after, and lightly rake it into the soil. So this is that same house from that earlier picture. Um, once their low mow turf was established, um, this is a turf composed of side oats or grama grass. Um, low mow turfs can be also fescues or buffalo grass or a mixture of these. So if you're going this route, you're, you're actually helping the soil evolve into a healthier state. Uh, when, when you have nine inch roots, uh, the soil is producing more of those microorganisms that uh, will resist weeds naturally. Um, if, you're, if you're into a healthier soil, um, that's, that's the area that weeds aren't as interested in because weeds specialize in, in disturbance and uh, less less of a mature soil community. Um, once you establish that community, you're starting to be able to be resistant to weeds. Um, you can mow one to two times a year, or just try to keep it low and mow more often, but um, it's recommended this type of grass have got to be at least three, to, three and a half to four inches. Um, it can uh, go much longer, up to nine, and these grasses will also lean over. They kind of create a, a nice texture of uh, guinea pig hair or something like a Dr. Seuss tufty grass. And you know that's that's different, but it's also pretty attractive and, and that's a, a nice yard feature as well. Um, so with this you want to aerate in the fall for depth and density. And also expect to go through with the thatch rake. So you're not mowing, um, it's still overall less maintenance, but um, having more standing vegetation on the surface will mean uh, maintaining uh, the consistency um, manually um, so that you don't smother or you don't get dead spots with too much thatch. Uh, you 
Um, break that off in the fall. Uh, you still want some thatch in there because um, that's that's how these plants are uh, adapted to grow. But uh, that's that's part of the maintenance. After no mow turf, you can go into sedges. Again, this is higher standing cover, uh, still uniform, low complexity, and uh, really gets that tufty, tufty uh, lean over look. Um, this again, you'll have to plan on uh, raking out the dead material uh, in the early spring to uh, make space for new growth, and that maintains the consistency. And then we have ground covers. This is where you get a little more complex. You can pick and choose whether you're on sun sunny or shady area. Uh, this is an example from the watershed shown earlier. Examples of these are dwarf bush honeysuckle, great consistent ground cover. And it stays dense, it likes to fill in spaces. Coral bells. Bunch grasses are a great option. Little blue stem, June grass, switch grass, or prairie drop seed. Uh, plant these close together and um, they will create a lot of texture in the fall into winter. Prairie drop seed uh, is one of the bigger ones that uh, leans over, uh, creates that Dr. Seuss kind of look. Um, obviously these are for places that you're not walking through. You, you want it to be a, a nice feature that you can see over there and you're not, once it's growing and once it's midsummer, um, you're not really concerned about about walking or running around. Uh, the flowering options, Joe Pieweed, uh, really likes to be dense and you know if you have a space that you want to fill and you want it to let it do what it does, that's a great option. And the fern category. Sensitive fern makes a great ground cover. Hay scented fern. Or maidenhair fern. Wild ginger, another option. And grow low sumac. That's what you see in this uh, photo in the background with, um, with this example. Um, it's a great ground cover. It will spread, but uh, if that's what you are trying to do, uh, it'll be reliable. And the fun part about this planning is uh, brainstorming a combination. What what are these strategies from different parts of the spectrum can you use in your yard? Um, this combination is uh, a yard that has some prairie in the background, it has the Lomo turf as a uh, path that, that allows you to walk through the yard. And then it has a rain garden here in the foreground. Uh, so that's three different strategies. And just taking a random house property uh, parcel, uh, here's a few, here, a few ways to approach it. Um, this purple area is an area that could be uh, high standing ground cover. Uh, something like the wet area in the yard, uh, something you don't want to mow, that can be sectioned off and dedicated to Joe Pieweed, or something that, that will want to be wet and grow there. This dark green are those strips of low complexity, higher standing vegetation. So the sedge ground covers, maybe uh, consistent bunch grass, it's just uniform, um, it's, it lets you reduce mowing uh, and then um, has an attractive feature next to the house, a, a nice transition. This light green could be an area of shrubs uh, where you start getting into the woody plants. You, you want a privacy fence, uh, then, then you go into dogwood or your service berries, um, low bush honeysuckle, uh, those kinds of things. The yellow one is a, a way to start to increase your complexity, uh, do some pocket native uh, plantings for uh, flowering things like bee balm or 
or some grasses mixed into there, but, but playing around with a little more complexity. And this blue area would be something like a rain garden. Uh, you get uh, designated uh, intake from runoff from the roof, uh, carve that out. It's more like a bowl kind of planting uh, that, that takes some engineering and soil amendments to get that right. There's uh, other resources and workshops we dedicate entirely to rain gardens. Um, but, you know, if you have a particular wet spot where you would rather consolidate the water and have it, you know, be expected to be right here versus over there where you're trying to play, um, rain garden is a great way to, to do that. And it still helps us uh, increase our storage on the landscape for downstream. Um, and there's really no wrong way to do this. Uh, it has to work for your maintenance. It has to work for what you're willing to do in terms of time and physical ability. But, uh, you know, this is just to show that it's possible to uh, pick and choose, uh, be creative, and try a number of different strategies. Um, you know, it, it can be going lightly, but doing something and trying something out is better than doing nothing at all. Um, so it's it's great to try these out and get these different strategies uh, when whenever possible. So here's some more examples. Uh, the uh, the dilemma of turf, like I mentioned, is that sometimes it doesn't want to be turf, and it uh, it might it might look fine for some of the year, but this is an area where obviously the the lawnmower is struggling to get into that back area, so it ends up being unmowed. And then it's not intentional, so you'll get uh, a lot of reed canary grass or some of the invasive species that just take advantage of, of this, un, um, this, this space that's kind of unintentional. So this one became a strategic planting where uh, the turf was converted over. And instead of trying to maintain all that wet area, uh, these plants... There's a tamarack back there. There's there's a bunch of things that want to be wet. They'll take the standing water, and um, and it overall creates an easier easier yard maintenance routine. The trick is, of course, getting it established. And and I'm not gonna uh, butter that up. That's it's a process, and and you should be ready for uh, some some time to get things established and and, and going. Here's that same property, new plants, and they're getting wet. Uh, so, how can you turn your soggy spots into attractions? Um, with some intention and with some dedication to convert it over, you might have to bring in some mulch to protect the, the plantings. You might have to do some watering for uh, a few weeks, uh, six to eight weeks, really, to get things established. But once it's established, Plants from soggy spot floodplain types of areas uh, survive in those areas by creating dense, thicker, deeper root mats. It's part of their strategy uh, to uh, get more contact with the soil, to try to get more air in a space where air is very limiting in the wet areas. Um, Jewelweed on the left is a very attractive native flowering plant. Uh, it, it does spread, but in a wet area, uh, you would want it to spread and cover that, that space. Uh, once it's getting into your upland dry area, it's going to stop uh, being as um, pro prolific. Obedient plant on the right is another very attractive flowering perennial. And then you've got the green features, arrowhead or, again, sensitive fern, uh, things that want to be dense and, and they can live in, in these wet areas. Uh, once you get started, there's all these plants on the right that are just examples. Um, obviously, you would really want to, tr uh, and you would really want to strategize for planting something like wood nettle. You obviously wouldn't want something like dogs or, or kids running around if, if that's an okay fit where it's really uh, uninhabitable space and you're, you're not using it. You know, nettles are okay. Um, 
Canada anemone, prairie dock, uh, some sunflowers uh, like sawtooth sunflower will thrive there. Uh, Joe pieweed, sneezeweed, wool grass. Um, it can actually be really fun to find the ones you like, try it out. You don't have to convert everything over uh, all at once. You might have to see if it takes and is it is it enjoying that spot and maybe you try three things very lightly and whatever takes you start encouraging that and after a few years uh, you could start to be shifting into um, into a more water friendly ground cover um, the rain garden idea uh, as I mentioned uh, takes a uh, what would be a wet yard and consolidates that moisture into a single spot. Uh, lets the rest of the yard be easier to maintain if you're mowing that area. And then it creates your attractive pollinator friendly species. Uh, this one in, uses cardinal flower which is a great plant for hummingbirds. And um, you know if, if you're a homeowner that wants to uh, be a gardener in a way. You could have a lot of complexity uh, maintaining this area or you could have a rain garden with say just a couple of species. It could be very simple. Um, so that's the the wonderful part about designing and, and doing what you need to do. Uh, that's another example of a wet area turned into planting bed. Uh, this one is a pop-up rain garden. The downspout goes underground and then it oops, it pops up in the middle uh, with a special device that will allow water to pool right there. Um, so what areas of our landscape have temporary inundation? Maybe it's uh, up to 48 hours. Uh, it's still pretty wet and um, not long enough for it to be a wetland or even for mosquitoes to um, to breed in standing water but wet enough to be a nuisance if you're if you're trying to bring a mower through um, this is a, an area that has a, a grade that encourages quick water movement so so that that river of sorts during high water will get water away but um, for downstream wetlands, it's actually good to store that longer here. So if there's a planting that can be in, in this type of ditch setting, uh, you would you would still get your temporary inundation, but uh, letting that water sit longer, especially if there's no basement foundations around, is, is more stable for the water table. Uh, floodplain strategies. This is a picture of willow and dogwood stakes. Uh, they are trimmings from other shrubs and uh, staked into the ground. They will start to uh, root and leaf out and um, a great way to uh, buffer shorelines. That's another example of what used to be turf all the way down to the water into uh, native planting to be a buffer. And floodplains. Um, some areas in our watershed are are technical floodplains, um, but in the 60s to 70s, uh, our neighborhoods weren't always designed according to where the floodplains are. Um, it can kind of create some um, tough puzzles, uh, d conflicting expectations about about what the yard should be and um, and where water should go. But sometimes a floodplain can also be an asset. Uh, Back to those plant examples, um, arrowroot, jewelweed, speckled alder is another great shrub that will look attractive. Uh, it's great for wildlife and it can get wet feet. Woodmint is another one um, and that, that might be a little more upland, closer to the yard, but still, still is capable of, of getting into these wet zones. Uh, sandbar willow or tamarack trees are other options. So basically there's there's a plant that could go in almost any area. Um, wrapping up we have some resources that we uh, recommend. 
the U of M Turf Lab has a turf conversion video series uh, so that you can follow different methods, different steps, and really see it in action. Uh, the U of M extension has those herbicide application instructions. Like I mentioned, very important to follow the instructions. Do it right um, if that is your chosen method. Uh, Blue Thumb has a story of a yard uh, on their web page. You can see a yard go through a whole arc of transformation and um, learn from that. Um, Backyard Habitats has a link on sheet covering, the smothering technique, and Ramsey County has all the details you will need about using their yard waste sites if you're trying to dispose of yard waste. Um, and that touches on sod and soil disposal. Due to jumping worms, Ramsey County no longer accepts uh, soil and sod. Um, they have alternatives on their website for different places to take these and um, it, it just requires some planning ahead. Anoka County at this point, at this time of recording, still accepts these um, but do check the location details um, especially as things change. There's other options if you have a bunch of sod and soil that you've, you've used or that you're no longer using, you want another spot for it, uh, think about grading and building up other areas, uh, something like building up a foundation, and creating a berm. Uh, a curved berm creates more of a higher area, uh, and that can be a, another planting feature. Different types of plants are going to uh, thrive higher up in a little drier habitat, so, so you're playing with that habitat variation. Um, it can also help uh, boost a privacy fence. Uh, check with your yard waste hauler service for different uh, disposal services. Uh, the private companies that are on the Rams County website are um, places to take soil. And sod and soil are not to be disposed of in wetlands, ditches, or slopes that lead to wetlands or ditches. Um, that's super important to help keep material uh, where it belongs on the landscape uh, when it's put into these areas that um, are in these dynamic wetland ditch places. Um, it's, it's not good for water resources. It speeds up the uh, rate at which our waterways get clogged and over-nutrient over nutrified and um, it creates a hassle for someone downstream. Um, city tax dollars need to clean that up and uh, keep things keep things cleared out. Uh, when ordering new soil plants, these two strategies are, are what you look for. Um, seek MNLA best management practices or this phrase called following the process to further reduce pathogens. Um, so this connects to if you're grading or if you're building a berm, uh, if you're taking soil from one area and just keeping it on site, you're likely going to need to bring in more to smoothen it out and to really make it attractive into a, a, a new planting bed. Um, but overall, it's probably a lot easier than hauling away and, and putting all the work into disposing it. And um, all right, I will stop the recording and we'll go with questions. Uh, thank you so much for checking this out and exploring this topic. And uh, we hope to be in touch. Um, reach out if you have other questions.